If you don't know um, about the California School-Based Health Alliance, I do want to make sure that we're all on the same page for this. But CSHA is a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing school health services and schools. And we do this through advocating for more school-based health centers, as well as uh, supporting existing school-based health centers. Um, and we do this through policy work, capacity building work, um, and also through technical assistance, uh, such as this webinar that we are hosting for you all today. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about us, there is our website right there on this slide. Um, to find more information about us, feel free to check us out. You know, we do have recording slides and other additional resources um, that you can use as well. Um, and I want to make sure I put this on your radar as well, but we have our annual CSHA conference on Monday, April 17th. Um, and the following day, we have our advocacy day, which is Tuesday, uh, April 18th. And both of these will be held in Sacramento. So if you're interested in this and if you don't already have it on your calendar, please uh, put it on your calendar. Um, and we hope to see you all at our conference in April. And in conjunction with conference, if you sign up to be um, a member of CSHA, you will get conference registration discount, as well as technical assistance tailored to your organizational needs. Um, here's a link to sign up if you're interested in that. Again, all the slides will be uh, sent out after this webinar, so no need to rush and take a picture of this or type this into your tab right now. It will be sent out to everyone after this webinar. Uh, and with that, I want to introduce our presenter for today. So we have Stephen Lambert from uh, Orange County Department of Education. He is their prevention coordinator. Um, he has 15 years of experience in substance use prevention, positive youth development, family and community engagement, and developmental asset building. Uh, in his role at the OCDE, he supports schools and districts with training and technical assistance around alcohol, tobacco, and other drug prevention. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you, Stephen. I'm going to go ahead and stop Thank my screen much. share. Oh, let's see. Sorry, it's not like popping up for me right now. Stop share. There we go. Perfect. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me. And uh, thank you again to the California School-Based Health Alliance uh, for hosting this webinar. I'm looking forward to sharing with you some of the current youth vaping trends for all of us who are working with young people throughout the state in a variety of contexts. Uh, there have been a lot of changes around vaping since the last time I did this uh, for CS, uh, CSHA. I think it was maybe two or three years ago. Um, and even since then, a lot has changed. So you will see some information here that might be a bit of a review. Um, and there will be some new things in here that previously I haven't talked about uh, in this setting before. And um, just so everyone's sort of on the same page, there will be some foundational information about vaping. So my hope is that by the end of this webinar, you'll be better informed about what the issues currently are, um, what sort of devices there are uh, out there in the community, some of the changes there, some of the key messaging that we need to be aware of when it comes to talking about vaping of nicotine and cannabis uh, with young people, some of the changes in our policy landscape, um, and some of the resources that are available to you. So again, today, I'm going to start with the essentials. What is vaping all about? What are these types of devices and what is in them? Talk about the policy and regulation pieces and wrap up with the triangulum or the combination or overlap between tobacco and cannabis use along with vaping. So let's jump right in with vaping essentials. So many of you, I know I see some familiar names in the Tupi, uh, the Tupi world in our attendee list here. Some of you will be familiar with this. Um, this is our spot the vape challenge. So how many vaping related items do you see here on this desk? So go ahead and in the chat, if you'd like to take a guess how many there are, I know some of my tippy people, <laughs> you have the answer right away. Uh, but take a look, take a look at this photo of a desk and see if you can identify how many vaping related items are here. Uh, in, in some of you, I'm sure are now using this, hopefully using this slide in your presentations as well. Okay, I see some seven. I see a couple of guesses of six. Mark, of course. Uh, <laughs> I know you've seen this one before. All right. So the answer is seven. 
So when you look at this, uh, you can see all seven devices we have. So I'm just going to go in numerical order, a Soren Air, a bottle of e-liquid, a Juul charging on the laptop, a puff, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, marijuana cartridge vape pen, a Stizzy, a puff bar, and a Soren Air. Uh, so a Soren Drop and a Soren Air. So an assortment of devices here that really fit right in among the other typical student-related paraphernalia. Um, and so you can use this, again, you're going to get copies of the slides, but you can use this activity. There's a thing link version as well that you'll be able to access and use um, when you're educating staff, educating parents and families. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. So as we move forward, uh, let's make sure that we're all on the same page about a really high level view of what vaping is and how it works. So I'm going to play a short video for you. Sit tight. Many teens think e-cigarettes are a safe alternative to traditional cigarettes. But like smoking, using e-cigarettes or vaping can harm your health. Often called vapes, e-cigarettes come in different shapes and sizes. They may be designed to look like tobacco cigarettes or resemble everyday objects like USB sticks. While they may look different, e-cigarettes are all designed to work in similar ways. When someone puffs on the mouthpiece, a battery heats up a liquid contained inside the device. This liquid then turns into an aerosol that is inhaled. The aerosol resembles a vapor. Depending on the device, e-cigarette aerosol may appear as a thick cloud or be barely visible. But all e-cigarette aerosols are a mixture of chemicals, some of which are known to be harmful. Some of these substances are in the liquid, such as nicotine, the same highly addictive chemical in tobacco, and chemicals used to flavor the aerosol. These flavor chemicals can be harmful to the lungs when inhaled. Some of the chemicals in the aerosol are created when the e-cigarette liquid is heated. These can include acrolein, a potentially harmful chemical also used in weed killers. If that's not enough, some e-cigarette aerosol also contain toxic metals. So think about it. When someone vapes, they can be exposing their body to a number of harmful chemicals. All right, so I, I was typing a response in the chat, but I'll go ahead and address it verbally. So yes, this video is from The Real Cost of Vaping, which is a curriculum put together by um, the FDA in partnership with Scholastic. And you can have free access to uh, their entire video series, um, lesson plans, and things like that if you look up The Real Cost. And uh, this will be linked in the slides that I'm going to send out as well. Uh, I recently saw that they finally have uploaded all their videos onto YouTube onto their YouTube channel. So they're even easier to get access to. I actually had to re-upload this myself. Um, so it makes it even easier to embed it into your slide decks. So we'll make sure that you all have access to that. Okay. So I love that video because I think it gives a really nice, concise definition of how vaping works and how, despite all the variation in the devices, they really all function in the same way. Um, and even talking about how some of the chemicals that we're familiar with in the aerosol get there, some of which are in the liquid and some come from the heating process. So really like that video. It's very concise. So with that, let's jump in and talk about some of these types of devices. Um, when we began way, way, way back uh, with the Sigalikes, those were disposable, right? And it's interesting how we've come full circle, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so we had these disposable cigarette looking devices. Then we moved on to the vape pens, which became extremely prolific uh, in the mid 2000s, mid 2010s. And then we moved on to the tanks and the mods, right? So the super high powered ones that put the Pirates of the Caribbean clouds out into the sky. Um, so those became very popular. And then we moved on to the Juul, right? So 2017, Juul hit the market, the closed pod systems where instead of filling the liquid uh, or having it disposable, you'd have the little pods that had tons of flavors, big legal battles ensued, right? Um, and also one thing that you'll notice too, as you move along from the, from the mods into the disposables, is the pricing is going to change. So I'm going to touch more on that later. But one of the reasons that these open or refillable systems, like you see in the middle here with the Soren Air, Soren Drop, sorry, happened is that it was cheaper um, to buy one of these refillable devices, recharge it, and then put more liquid in, as opposed to buying more pods that became very costly. And so you started to see a lot of people pivoting toward these open refillable systems. And then finally, we arrive at the disposables. Uh, and these are full circle, um, back to disposable items. And we'll talk about why that is in just a couple slides. 
But as they described in the video, that e-liquid that's being heated up and turned into an aerosol has three major parts. So the majority of it is just a clear, thick liquid, uh, kind of like a syrup, which is propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin, some combination thereof. Um, then you have artificial flavorings and the nicotine inside that liquid. And of course, we're talking about nicotine vaping here. Um, the only thing you really need to know about the e-liquid is that all three of those components play a role in some of the health risks associated with vaping. So while propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin aren't harmful at room temperature and in liquid form, they're used in foods, cosmetics, things like that. I've seen them come up in like um, candy bars, things like that. It, there's nothing harmful about them except once heated. So when they're heated, as they talked about in the video, some of the chemicals start to come out from those changes from heating the liquid. Now, something I wanted to address here with this group is this idea of nicotine salt vaping. So you may hear nic salt, nicotine salt. I wanted to explain what that is. So in the beginning, when it came to vaping, uh, there, what they were using in the liquid was something called freebase nicotine. It's very scary sounding, right? It takes us back to the, the crack cocaine era. But this is just the, the basic form of nicotine that was being used in e-liquids. And then when Juul came along, they were able to change the formula, adding what's called nicotine salts and then benzoic acid to change the pH. And what that did, so you don't need to know all the details, but what that did is allowed them to have very high potency without the harshness. Because as they were trying to increase the nicotine levels in the traditional liquid, it was getting very harsh and almost unusable. So Juul came along with this nicotine salt liquid and completely changed the landscape of vaping because nicotine salt vaping provides a very quick effect. So a lot of people, when they were using the old style free-based nicotine vaping devices, they weren't necessarily getting the same effect as with cigarettes, but this has it. So nicotine salt rushes to the brain very quickly. Young people, I remember when Juul was kicking off, they're saying, oh yeah, I vape by Juul for the, the head rush. And they didn't understand that they're feeling the effects of nicotine. They didn't make that association. Um, you get all these sweet flavors and the scents, and it's a very cool and humidified aerosol. So unlike cigarette smoking, which is very harsh, dry, makes you cough, you're breathing something in that really is not that unpleasant. So as a result, it's very, very easy for young people to get sucked in and to start doing this and not connect to the potential harms with what they're doing because it feels very innocuous when compared to cigarette smoking, but has all of that nicotine potential. So as I mentioned earlier, disposables are now the new phase. So uh, this is from the CDC. They did their uh, NY, I'm sorry, National Youth Tobacco Survey, Survey or NYTS. And they found that among young people across the country and I'm here in California as well, these disposables have taken over as the most popular form of vaping device. There's still other types around, don't get me wrong, but this absolutely took off. And one of the key reasons for that is this. So we all remember, you know, all of us in public health and, and working in tobacco control, uh, the sort of jewel panic that happened. I mean, rightfully so, right? It was absolutely taking over. It had the most visibility, the most market share. Um, and this was, I believe, back in 2019, 2020, when this was happening, there was a ban on these sweet flavored pods. So when they said, okay, no more mango pods, no more, you know, fruit punch pods. They didn't include one-time use disposable vaping devices in there. And so as a result, you started to see this explosion of disposable products on the market, Puff Bar being the most notorious and is still around. So this is partly why, and you can access, this is from the New York Times. You can go check out that article later when you click through the slides. Uh, but this absolutely was the root of why these things took off. That's really the story of tobacco control and vaping uh, in general is loopholes and greed. That's really what it boils down to. Anytime there's a change, it's because of that. So I'm going to show you just a, a couple examples of what these disposable devices look like, some of the new forms and the shapes that they're taking on. Uh, up in the top left, these are sort of the classic, if you will, disposable puff bar style uh, devices that look like you know sticks of gum, juicy fruit, right? course, lots of fun flavors and colors. Then you have these sort of thumb looking devices with the mouthpiece up at the top. 
Uh, and then of course the door stop, as I like to call them, uh, these wedge style devices and uh, these spout kind of bottle looking things. Uh, and it's hilarious, well, not hilarious, but it's interesting that as I look back on these slides now, um, I was already concerned when I had first put these together about the number of puffs that you see in some of these devices. But as I'll describe later, it continues to grow. If you look at the numbers here, you'll see uh, 10 milliliters of liquid, 5% nicotine. Um, you see 2,000 puffs. So start thinking to yourself, how much is that? How much, how much do you think that is in terms of compared to a jewel pot or things like that? So I, I didn't want to go on to some of the details without addressing this. So like I was talking about, so much of what's going on with vaping boils down to knockoffs, loopholes, and greed. So when there was a lot of reaction to all the FDA regulations happening, so the FDA was starting to crack down and say, you all are selling vaping products that are not approved, so we're going to send you angry letters. <laughs> um, lots of knockoffs started to come onto the scene. So what you see here uh, on this slide are different knockoff puff bars um, and people on forums on Reddit trying to de determine if they're if what they've bought is real or not. Um, and what's interesting here, this is a comment from uh, one of the posters. How can I tell if it's fake? One of my friends completely stopped buying it because he said he felt a burning sensation in his throat. Right. So we all remember what happened with the volley pre-COVID, where people were, you know, manufacturing these counterfeit knockoff vape cartridges, particularly the cannabis oil ones, and people are getting very sick. And yet here we are years later, and people still have not gotten the message. When you buy these things off of pretty much anyone, you are rolling the dice, and it really is not subject to a stringent level of regulation and testing. Uh, I just for for visual purposes. I'm putting here a puff bar on the left and then three very similar looking devices over to the right. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, how can you sue somebody if what you're manufacturing is technically illegal, right? So suffice it to say, there are tons and tons of knockoffs and ripoffs and counterfeits being sold uh, of myriad disposable vaping devices. And that is something that we should be concerned about when it comes to youth safety, and they should be concerned about as well. So the really major factors uh, for why these things have persisted in their popularity, number one is that they are very sweet. So again, they have circumvented a lot of these bans on flavors. Um, and then the other part here is that they are extremely cheap, right? So let's figure out how cheap they are, um, the amount of nicotine in disposable vapes. How many cigarettes worth do you think uh, are in these disposable vapes when it comes to nicotine? How many cigarettes uh, do you think? So go ahead and put in the chat what you think it is. Do you think that in like a puff bar, let's say, there are 10 cigarettes worth, 20 cigarettes worth, 30 or 40 and up? Yes, we have a well-educated crowd here. <laughs> it is definitely 40 and up because some of you may remember a lot of the um, publications around jewel pods stating a jewel pod is the equivalent to a pack of cigarettes worth of nicotine. So all of these devices, pretty much without exception, are in excess of 40 cigarettes. So let's do some calculations here. This is a newer device you may not be familiar with. So in our description for the webinar, we talked about the Flume Float. This is the Flume Pebble. Uh, it contains 14 milliliters of liquid at 5% nick salt strength which is approximately 700 milligrams of nicotine. Um, and a cigarette typically delivers one milligram. Uh, so this device is so full of liquid that you actually can recharge it. So it's a rechargeable disposable, which blows the mind, right? Um, and this is not an exception. This is the norm. In fact, I'm going to tab over for you and show you uh, when you look at like a vaping, what? Oh, by the way, I'm going to pause here. I'm I am deeply amused that I'll go to prevention websites and my work Wi-Fi will block me, but somehow I can go onto these um, vape shop websites on my. I'm probably on a list with IT. I, I, this probably applies to a lot of you, uh, but anyways, that's just a side note. Here on this vaping uh, website, you can see when I go to disposables, the top selling or recommended devices here, right? 
Elf Bar is a huge one that you need to know about. But all of these devices up here, you'll see something in common. Most of them are very large. 5,000 puffs, 7,000 puffs, 6,000, 3,000. I think 2,500 is the smallest one you'll see on this page. And remember what we said about jewel pods, right? 200 puffs. So it is an absolutely obscene amount of nicotine that is being crammed into these devices. Um, and as you can see here from the Flume Float page, still very much available in all of these flavors from Tropical Delight to Rainbow Skittle to Blue Raspberry Ice, right? So when you do the calculations and you see, oh, this thing's $15 it makes very much sense. This is in terms of value proposition, why young people would flock to these. We know that they are price sensitive when it comes to substance use, meaning when a price goes up, use goes down and vice versa. So if you are able to get the equivalent of you know 10 packs of cigarettes or more worth of nicotine for 15 bucks, 12 bucks, it makes sense why it is so easy for them to get involved in the behavior and why it is so hard to quit when you have all of this nicotine at your disposal. Okay, so I did want to just take a little more time uh, to describe that for you because these the, the landscape has absolutely changed uh, when it comes to these devices and, and just the sheer quantity of nicotine that is in them. Okay, so what did you observe at your school site, at your district, in the communities that you serve? I want to hear, go ahead and fire off, sound off in the chat. Uh, what have you seen in terms of the devices, uh, in terms of you know what um, what students are saying uh, about nicotine addiction or the potency of these things? What have you heard? What have you seen? So I'll give you just a couple minutes to throw some responses into the chat because I'd really like to hear. Does this resonate with the, some of the shifts that you've seen, or are you still seeing a lot of the pods or the open systems? So go ahead and uh, toss some, some of your responses into the chat and I'll wait for those to come in. And while you are doing that, I'm going to advance uh, to this slide here. And this is a resource from Truth Initiative called the Vaping Lingo Dictionary. On the front side, it's a two-pager. On the front side, it has the different types of systems that I just described that are still very prevalent among young people. And on the back that I don't have pictured here, but you'll see in the PDF, um, is some of the typical slang associated with vaping that you should be aware of. So I'll, I'll continue to uh, look at these responses in the chat uh, as you can access this resource. Elf bars, yep. Oh, flume is number one. Interesting. The disposables, they have no idea how much nicotine is in there. Absolutely. Puff bar, flume, and elf bars. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The THC vaping devices, which what we will get into. Yes, Derek. So 14, 14 milliliters at 5% nick salt. That's right. So 5% nick salt. It, and I have, I have some uh, notes I think I provided in one of my other slide decks um, for, for parents. Uh, where you can do these calculations because, and some have suggested that the way that these devices are labeled can be misleading because they'll label things 50 milligrams or 50 milligrams per milliliter or 5%. And all three of those things are the exact same thing. So 50 milligrams per milliliter, and then you have 14 milliliters, you just have to multiply it. So 14 times 50 is 700, which again, <laughs> is just an absolutely, uh, I mean, just ridiculous amount of nicotine. Um, so 700 milligrams of nicotine. Flume, puff bar, THC. Oh, the wearables. Oh, so those are still around. Interesting. I'm going to talk about that in a second. At the school dances, having them on the desk. Absolutely. Well, thank you everybody for sharing the experiences that you're having in the school sites and districts. I will get into it more uh, around THC when we get to the triangulum. So let's move forward and talk a little bit about policy and regulation. But first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah. 
I'm just kidding. I'm not sponsored by vaporware. I just found that that commercial to be hilarious. There's nothing more masculine than vaping out of your sweatshirt as you ride your motorcycle with no helmet on. Um, it's, it's seeing the same advertising techniques that have persisted for decades is just amusing to me. So this is vaporware. You may or may not have heard about these sweatshirts where you can plug one end of your drawstring into a vape and then vape out of the other side, very incognito. Well, the FDA got mad at them and sent them a letter and actually they did pull <laughs> all of their products. So right down below you see, uh, I know it's, what is this? The prime day sale going on right now. If you were to look up vaporware on Amazon, this is what you would see currently unavailable. So for all of my complaints about the FDA's actions uh, when it comes to vaping, sometimes their letters do make an impact. Um, I just found it interesting that that was one of the, the companies that they chose to target. There's a lot going on with, with the FDA right now in terms of tobacco control. Uh, you may have heard Again, the back and forth with Juul, which has gone on now for, oh, I think like three years. Um, and the latest chapter in this saga is the FDA denying their uh, pre-market authorization for Juul. So, and then that got kicked back. They're appealing it. So this is going to be a very long protracted battle between the FDA and Juul. Uh, and in the meantime, you see that headline down below um, non-nicotine, non-tobacco, sorry, nicotine products. I did want to talk about this for a second. So Puff Bar, um, again, being the most infamous among the disposal uh, disposable products, they said, well, okay, FDA, maybe you can regulate tobacco products, but we're going to start using synthetic nicotine in our vapes so that you have no authority here. You can't regulate us. And so then... Um, Puff Bar said, uh, the FDA said, oh, that's that's a bummer. I guess we can't. And then lo and behold, Congress, uh, as part of the omnibus spending bill, wrote in their additional regulations extending the FDA's authority to regulate synthetic nicotine products. So surprise, um, they are now uh, taking action on those items as well. Although I will note, this is a very long battle um, and many of these devices that are being sold they're continuing to proliferate, be sold uh, through overseas marketplaces and things like that, um, and, and skirting all of these restrictions, regardless of what the FDA is doing and how many letters they send. So the other thing that's happening right now uh, is the FDA has rolled out some huge, very ambitious goals for nationwide tobacco control that you might be hearing about. So number one, they are proposing banning menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars across the country and proposing reducing the addictive level of nicotine or reducing the level of nicotine in cigarettes to a non-addicting level. So basically creating Odul cigarettes and, and making sure that capping the level of nicotine in cigarettes so that it's no longer addictive. So these two items will be an extremely long process. There will be endless appeals and arguments from the tobacco industry. And I'm sure just an absolute parade of, of advertisements on social media, on every form of media, uh, when these restrictions begin even to be thought about. Right now, I think they're in proposal, rule proposal uh, right now. So it's, it's going to be a very long time before either of these take effect, uh, if in fact they do. But you may have heard actually a lot of the big tobacco companies are completely pivoting here in the United States away from combustibles and saying, I think it was um, uh, not RJ Reynolds, it was Philip Morris who said, we're going to go smoke free uh, within the next 10 years, which uh, I mean is amusing, but also scary to think about, okay, well, what is their game plan? Um, what is their end game? So keep your eye on that as these things come down the pike, uh, but they are still a very long way away. Something that is not a long way away is this. So Prop 31 is going to be on the ballot on November 8. I just got my absentee in the mail. So uh, we're in election season now. Um, what you may or may not know is that way back, uh, the, the, the California Senate, state Senate, had SB 793, which would ban uh, flavored tobacco sales in California uh, across the state. And uh, what happened was enough signatures were gathered to put it to referendum. So um, even though that bill had passed in the legislature, now 
all voters in California will be voting whether or not they want to uphold that ban. So if Californians vote yes, then it will be upheld and flavored tobacco sales will be prohibited here in California with a few exceptions, I think, for some hookah products and whatnot. And then if California votes no, then that will be repealed and then things will sort of just continue the way that they are. Um, this won't impact anything that's done at the local level. I know there are cities and counties uh, who have, have done similar bans at the local level. It won't affect those in any way. So a lot going on uh, when, when it comes to regulation, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the marijuana side of things later uh, in terms of the marketplace. But I do want to know, based on, you know, we've seen all these letters going out, we've seen all this action with the FDA, have you noticed any changes in the ways young people are accessing vapes? So if you could sound off in the chat um, with some of the ways that you are hearing young people still getting access to these things. Um, despite not having a lot of these products available in most of the stores out there as easily available as they used to be, uh, supposedly certain restrictions for online sales and ID checking. So in light of all of that, what have you seen uh, in terms of the ways that young people access vapes? Go ahead and drop those into the chat and I'll wait just for a moment for those uh, responses to come in. directly from the stores, family members, other students buying in bulk, dealers on Snapchat, yes, getting them from other students at school, ordering online with fake IDs, purchasing from other students, Snapchat peers, older siblings, still adults buying them up and sharing. Uh, yes, uh, getting them at home because parents, older relatives, absolutely. Yeah, I that very much lines up with some of the stories that I hear uh, for, directly from students who are very forthcoming and very candid, even at the high middle school level, talking about, oh yeah, you know, you, you know a guy um, on Snapchat, you just text whatever you're looking for, and then they deliver it to your house. Um, and to hear, you know, thirteen year olds right talking about how they're able to get a hold of these things and knowing now, right, what we do about the fentanyl crisis and the fake pills and how those are proliferating in the exact same channels, it really does give us pause in terms of, um, you know, this sea change in the way in which young people are able to access things so readily. And something that I always talk about is um, what happened with COVID in a lot of ways is everybody got used to buying things online. And we all had to put a lot of trust into the people bringing us things and delivering things to us at our homes. And some of that trust was well-founded. Some of it is not well-founded. And I think that this familiarity and access with delivery apps and with just seeking things out online, um, I think a lot of that has trickled down into the way that young people view these things. And they think of it very matter of fact. It's not like you're meeting somebody in an alley. There is, I believe, this perceived safety of purchasing these things on social media through Snapchat, through you know your, your plug, your connect, whatever you want to call them. Um, and we really need to disrupt that because there are so many issues with counterfeits, knockoffs, and now the, the counterfeit pills as well. So thank you all. Uh, for sharing your responses. Wow. So I just want to call this one. I was tagged on my professional Instagram by vape vendors. I block and untag knowing they're trying to get to the students. Wow. That Now that is brazen, um, some brazen tactics uh, by these, by the vendors as well. Dispensaries giving edibles to kids to make, oh, geez. Okay. So we'll get into some of the, the marijuana stuff later, but that is, uh, that is terrifying. Yeah, so I think that there are still a lot of these same access pathways that did exist before, older relatives, older friends, adults, and you know vendors looking the other way. But this new addition of these social media deliveries is highly concerning. 
All right, so let's talk now about the triangulum. This is sort of our last large topic, but we're going to spend a while talking about this. So the triangulum um, is the term that the state has come up with to describe the intersections between smoking, vaping, and cannabis use. So as we all know, smoking and vaping can be used to consume nicotine products, tobacco products, and cannabis products. Um, very often, the behaviors are linked. Uh, young people who are engaging in one more likely to engage in the other. We know this from research, uh, and we also know this from data. So this is from our own Orange County data here, but it's very much the same throughout the state, showing that students who smoke cigarettes or use e-cigarettes who vape are more likely to use marijuana. So you can see there the pink bar is representing uh, current marijuana use among students who either smoke up at the top or vape down below. And you can see there 10 to 20 times uh, more likely to be using marijuana if they're smoking or using e-cigarettes. I will say, having looked at our data um, among a variety of different drugs, cigarette smoking had the highest predictive value, meaning that students who said that they were smoking cigarettes were the most likely to report any other form of substance use, prescription drugs, alcohol, marijuana, you name it. Um, and so keeping an eye on that, um, I know sometimes we take our eye off of cigarettes, right? We think that young people have gotten the message about it, but there are some opportunities there for some targeted outreach and reminding students, I think. Um, uh, just as a side note, I looked at our Healthy Kids survey data about perceived risk, and I was astounded to see that um, almost, I think, 15% of the high school juniors thought there was little or no risk to smoking a pack or more of cigarettes a day. Um, so maybe there is a generation here that has missed uh, not been exposed to cigarette smoke as much as we all were. And now sort of they, they maybe have forgotten some of the messages around the harms of it or seeing the immediacy of it. So uh, sorry, I took us on a, a sidetrack there. So let's talk about the devices themselves. So cannabis vaping devices uh, very much follow the same patterns as the nicotine vaping devices with a few particulars that I want to talk about. So over on the left-hand side is an example of a closed pod system. Uh, this is the infamous Stizzy. All of us in California know this, especially any of you who are up in LA, you're probably driven by their headquarters. Um, and Stizzy is, uh, at least in uh, where I am, a very popular brand uh, of cannabis vaping devices. And you swap out the pods, they contain the THC cannabis extract. Um, and then when it's empty, you put, put one back in. And then over on the right-hand side are the carts or cartridges. And um, the reason I have 510 there is just that's the name for the type of battery uh, vape pen that you put these things on. So you may hear that slang coming up when we talk about 510. Um, and so these just screw down onto a regular vape pen battery. Uh, and then once it's empty, you replace it. Uh, the carts are infamous because of what happened with the volley. A lot of the cases were specifically linked to these uh, cartridges, these cannabis cartridges that have vitamin E acetate, right? It had the, um, the additive in there that was becoming quite toxic when it was heated and inhaled. Both of these types of devices come in a variety of flavors. Sometimes the smell of marijuana is apparent. Sometimes it is not. The type, the kind of chemical that imparts those scents uh, and flavors to the marijuana, uh, to cannabis, are called terpenes. So you may hear terps or terpenes. And there are some processes where you get these cannabis concentrates that strip out. The terpenes. And so sometimes they'll add them back in to create certain flavors. So it's not a reliable indicator anymore to say, oh, this one smells like skunk, right? It's very complicated. They add in flavorings just like the nicotine ones. Sometimes it's completely masked. It is, it is very difficult. So I, I really feel for all the administrators out there and trying when you see one of these devices and you confiscate it to know exactly what is in it. It can be very difficult to tell um, even when looking at the viscosity of the liquid. So uh, it's not reliable uh, and all kinds of flavors and many, many issues here. Whenever we talk about the triangulum, I think it's important to address these two key things. So, oh yeah, so Derek brings up disposables. Yes, so- there are disposable uh, stizzies. There are disposable devices that look um, somewhat like the e-cigs of old, uh, dosis, things like that. So all kinds of shapes and sizes. Anything that you could see um, that looks like a nicotine vape, <laughs> it might also be a THC vape. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. 
So the two key areas that we really, really want to communicate to young people when it comes to vaping, whether it's nicotine or THC, are these. So the first, this high potency and brain development, the impact there. And second, poor quality control and counterfeits, right? Very, very relevant to what we're talking about. So let's start by talking about the potency. Um, way back, if you will, uh, in 2016, a high nicotine, which is laughable, seems laughable now, uh, the high nicotine blue e-cigs uh, were 16 milligrams per milliliter, right? Or if you wanted to put it in more common parlance, 1.6% nicotine. Uh, and then the nicotine salt vapes, like we were talking about, they're all in the 50 plus, right? Juul was 57. Um, you see 60 sometimes, now very commonly is 50 milligrams per milliliter or 5%. So you can see there are tripling in potency, not even taking into account the difference with nicotine salt. Um, and then we already talked about just how much nicotine is being crammed into these devices. And then over on the right-hand side, cannabis potency. So the average THC in, in dried bud back in 2014, it's about 12%. Um, still radically increased from the 90s where you would see things in like the three, four percent. And then the concentrates are all in the 80 plus percent range. I was looking at um, some Skywalker OG, this Stizzy pod, and it was 91%. And that's not atypical at all. Uh, that's pretty par for the course. And you see an escalation of THC and a dropping in the CBD. So you see that ratio, that gap there continuing to rise, meaning that the higher that that gap gets, the more of a high is created, the more of these effects that you see. And unfortunately, a lot of the negative side effects that you typically see with high potency cannabis becoming more pronounced, the anxiety, the paranoia, things like that. So that's pretty typical. Um, and there is more and more emerging research uh, about the impact of high potency cannabis, but still remains to be seen what the long-term effects are. So um, part of this potency race, this arms race of potency may help to explain that again for Orange County, while only about 8% of the 11th graders said that they were vaping currently, more than a third said that they were vaping daily. So 20 or more days in, uh, in a month. Uh, they were vaping. So pretty high rate of daily vaping among students reporting current vape use, which is alarming. Um, and I know all of you who work with students are experiencing this where you have, um, unfortunately, students who are if uh, coming to school, vaping at school, unable to stop, uh, struggling to quit. And much of it may have to do with just this absolutely ludicrous level of nicotine and THC in these devices. Yeah, so to answer your question in the chat, um, yeah, the joints are typically about, yeah, 12 or 14%. The dispensaries right now are selling bud that's in the 20% 20, 20 range around there. Um, but the concentrates, just by virtue of how they're made, they have a very, very high ratio. They're very pure. Some of the distillate, uh, a highly pure form called distillate, uh, approaches 100%, but usually you don't see, that's not that common um, compared to the other the other forms. But I mean, functionally, what's the difference between 91% and 100% THC? Um, it's very, very potent. And again, I, I don't believe that young people understand just how much is in these things. Um, so one thing that we talk about when it comes to uh, the impact of these high potency devices, we have to come back to the brain, right? And we know that both nicotine and THC can affect the parts of the brain responsible for learning, memory, attention, right? The three things that we really want students to have in place so that they can succeed academically and in life. And yet you see such a pronounced effect in the teen brain. And um, especially uh, during adolescence and when used during stress, these two drugs can drastically affect brain development and create addiction. So I did add that there. There's a couple of research sites that you can click again when you get the PDF. Um, but there is a significant research finding that when the brain, the teen brain is under stress and you've got the cortisol flowing, right? Um, it interacts with nicotine, with THC to make them more rewarding, so more addictive and to further affect that brain development. So, so, so important what you all are doing in helping young people understand positive coping strategies and ways to deal with their stress in pro-social healthy ways. Because if they go down this path, 
um, it can be so incredibly difficult for young people to quit, as you all know. Um, so, so just keeping that in mind as well in our messaging. This is a newer campaign from Truth uh, that you may have seen called Breath of Stress Air. Again, they have their very cheeky uh, ad campaigns about it. But if you go to this resource, uh, you can check out this page and they have a kind of a quick little video, but also um, some of the uh, key facts about how some of these things are positioned almost as wellness or as like, hey, take a break and vape. But what the reality is, is that when you're trying to use these things to deal with feelings of anxiety, depression, and stress, that it can worsen those conditions. So they're, they're unrolling this, this new campaign here, sort of a spinoff of their whole depression stick thing, which I, uh, I didn't really land with me if I'm being completely honest. Uh, I feel that this has taken a, a better course uh, with this new campaign. So... Um, I do want to talk about poor quality control and counterfeits because this is the other big issue that applies to both nicotine vapes and THC vapes, right? So I spent some time earlier talking about the knockoffs and people's throats burning from the puff bars that they're buying off of people. Um, and this has not slowed down at all. So here are three articles, again, that you can click through in the PDF, um, looking at even in, in states and areas that have legal sales, some of the issues surrounding getting clean products, right? And this is something that uh, we had a, a statewide coordinators webinar, um, uh, I think it was last week, and somebody from the tobacco Re TRDRP uh, was talking about just the proliferation of devices and the, and the lack of regulation. And I think that the average person, and I said this at that time, when you go into the store and you buy something, you think this must have been checked by somebody right? But when it comes to the disposables, particularly, that is not a guarantee just because they're really being sold to skirt regulations. The suppliers are all over the place and people are really not looking at these things very closely. So um, what these three things here are here, the bottom one, the bottom article is actually about somebody who's buying um, fake puff bars. And then the other two are related to the cannabis issue. So it is unfortunately not a sparkling, clean, sterile market place. I know that with the idea of legal marijuana sales, seed to sale, right? Everything would be tracked clean. Um, but the fact is not all of those things are perfect. Not all those systems are perfect. And so they do find, particularly in the cannabis cartridge um, area, sometimes there are uh, contaminations, uh, contamination, uh, heavy metals, pesticides, things like that. And then of course, we were talking about vitamin E acetate, right? which was one of those fillers that was put into the cannabis cartridges, making people very sick and causing that, um, that lung injury valley. So thankfully, hopefully, we're past the era of vitamin E acetate, but we are absolutely not out of the woods when it comes to people selling knockoffs and cheapos to try and make a buck. And <laughs> there is no better demonstration of that than Delta-8. So I'm not sure if any of you have heard of this already. I'm sure some of you have. You can click through these articles in the slides, uh, but Delta-8 is a new, well, not new, it's a different form of THC. So the one that we're most familiar with is Delta-9, right? So what happened was we had that big CBD gold rush, right? Where you were getting CBD dog treats, CBD lattes, CBD gummy bears, and everybody was making CBD because of the hemp bill and how you could now cultivate hemp across the country. So hemp has very low THC levels, but pretty decent amounts of CBD. So that already became a regulatory nightmare where people were selling CBD oil that had no CBD or very low levels or had THC. In it. So that was already a nightmare. So then what happened was the market got flooded. So we have all this hemp and all the CBD. Well, they figured out how to take CBD and process it into basically a different form of THC called Delta-8. Uh, and this stuff is out there. If you go and you look up cake vapes or you go, uh, I even see this advertised widely at smoke shops where you see it in the window on the, on the signs. Um, and this has become another sort of gray area product because it didn't come from the cannabis industry. It's not, you know, it's not sold in the dispensaries necessarily, but it's also, is this legal? Is it not? Um, and what you see here, these four articles are some of the issues surrounding it. So dirty marketplace, 
what always happens with these gray market things is if nobody's regulating it, uh, people will not look out for your best interests and will cut corners and will not test things clearly. And oh, interesting. Thank you, Derek. So Derek is saying most of the disposable pods we're finding are Delta 8. That is highly concerning. Um, and one of the things that you all should know, which is in the top left there, uh, this article is discussing the mislabeling of, of these devices, uh, the amounts and what is actually in them, and that these companies are getting very savvy. So you may or may not know, with cannabis products, a lot of them are required or encouraged to have testing results, right? So like how I was able to tell you that that pod had 91% THC is that they had it tested by a lab. So when you have cannabis products tested, they will have, have a certificate, right, from that testing lab. Um, well, unfortunately, some of these companies that are trying to make a quick buck have caught on to that and are now faking lab certificates saying, oh, our product is lab tested. It has this level of THC, this level of CBD, no lead, no pesticides. Um, and so again, that false sense of security and safety from getting this thing is highly concerning because we do not want young people or anyone really to be consuming products that are untested, unregulated, and potentially quite harmful um, with all of the, the nasty uh, contaminants that are out there. So bring that to your students' awareness that these things are in a very gray area and that the companies are not looking out for our best interests. So I do want to know uh, in the chat here what you all are uh, are seeing in terms of your dis discussions and your conversations with young people. This is our last question here. How do your students compare the risks of tobacco and cannabis? How do they compare them? How do you, how do they compare and contrast that? Do you think one is to think the risks are similar uh, when it comes to smoking or vaping, uh, vaping of cannabis? Do you think that they have this awareness about some of the the issues, the potency, um, and the 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 dirty marketplace? What do you think? How are they how are they talking about this in your conversations with them? So John says most of mine think tobacco is worse since the legalizing of marijuana. Tobacco is not good for you. Marijuana is not that bad, right? It's a plant, even though, because <laughs> tobacco is not a plant. Um, marijuana is just, you know, it's a natural plant. I think cannabis is healthier. Marijuana has medicinal use, right? Um, I think that that's a very important item to hone in on because let's face it, like we live now in a, a, a state or a country in which many of the young people that we work with um, probably have relatives who have used cannabis um, maybe with a you know from a medical dispensary things like that so the way that we have to address it i think is understanding the health risks and how they differ right so talking to students and saying look there are some people who are maybe using cannabis for medical purposes but does the fact that something is used medically make it harmless and is it harmless for everyone right think about the opioid crisis Pills, medications that are extremely helpful and beneficial for a lot of people have also created a great deal of harm and addiction when misused and not with the direction of a, of a doctor, right? And so just because something is sold legally, just because it's used for medicinal purposes by some people does not mean that it's absolutely harmless and does not mean that it's harmless for young people and their developing brains and bodies, right? We talk about the legal age of all these things being 21, right? And why is that? It has a lot to do with that brain development piece. And so it's our responsibility to communicate to young people that legal substances, illegal substances, counterfeit or real, all of these things can take a toll on the developing brain. Karen, I, I agree 100%. Um, we did have this sort of gap and we weren't prepared to have those conversations. And as students were seeing in their surroundings, I mean, I drive down the freeway and I see probably five or six billboards for dispensaries around here. Um, and even when it was in the semi-legal state uh, where we didn't have retail, but we had medical, they were all over the place. And young people see that. And you're right that we weren't prepared to have those conversations with students. And then I think that a lot of young people perceive this sort of reefer madness thing where, oh, you know, they're just exaggerating. There's no basis. And so it's up to us to pull us back to reality and say, look, um, the risks of these things are real. Maybe they have been exaggerated by some, but that's not what we're talking about here. Like we're talking about very science-based, health-based information. Um, so thank you for those, uh, those comments and questions. 
I'm going to put this up here. Uh, so we do have five minutes just to discuss uh, really anything. I know I've covered quite a lot of ground in here. I hope it wasn't overwhelming, but I did want to try and be as comprehensive as I could um, to address all of these issues uh, around vaping, whether it was THC or nicotine. So I hope that you found that useful. Um, please uh, ask any questions in the chat right now in these last five minutes, as I just share with you a couple of quick resources here. Um, this is our Tupi California website, and this is uh, where you can find information about different prevention curriculum, intervention services, cessation hotlines, how to engage parents and families, um, different uh, kind of crash courses on some of these issues that I just talked about and more. So this is our statewide tobacco uh, use prevention education website. You can check it out at 2pca.org. Uh, I'm going to leave my contact information up here and you can reach out to me directly. I'm going to drop this into the chat too, just in case. Um, but with that, uh, this is the entire presentation, so I'm hoping uh, we can do questions, and I know, uh, I think Trace is going to come back in. She has an evaluation survey for you as well, so I want to make sure that we get that in there because um, I know that's very important data. Uh, I, I respect the process, but please keep your questions coming uh, into the chat as uh, Tracy does that. Yeah, so we already have a question in here from Donna. Um, they're asking, are there any resources on marijuana cessation for teens? That's very interesting. So um, the YVAPE program, that's an intervention uh, that's sponsored by the California Department of Education, uh, is a counseling intervention that covers both the use of nicotine as well as cannabis vaping. Um, and so the, the sessions that they have and the information that they provide addresses both of those. Um, it is difficult because um, a lot, even when it comes to vaping cessation versus smoking, it is different. It's a different animal. And so they are developing a lot of new resources uh, to address that. But for cessation um, outside of an intervention setting, I can't really speak to that because a lot of that falls more into the substance use, um, substance use treatment side of things, as opposed to the way that we do cessation for tobacco products. So it's quite difficult uh, to address that at the local level, and particularly with younger students, where a lot of it has to involve the parents and the families and sometimes their primary care physicians um, in that conversation. So thank you for asking. I wish I had a better answer for that. Um, oh, so question about fentanyl. Yeah, so I have heard um, a scattering of reports, and I keep combing the news because you know I'm very concerned about fentanyl for obvious reasons. Um, and I think that it is still isolated cases of, um, of devices being tainted with fentanyl. And, and sometimes it's not like the what's inside it itself, but it's been, you know, and it was kind of held alongside fentanyl pills. And so that's how it got contaminated. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily the thing we need to be most concerned about when it comes to vaping, even though fentanyl is finding its way into every other area of the drug supply on the illicit drug side. So I still think that the chief concern for us is the counterfeit pills 100% because there's still so little awareness about it as well as illicit drugs. So when we're having conversations with students and we know that they're engaged in substance use, they need to know that if they're buying anything off of anyone, the probability of it having fentanyl in it is just so incredibly high right now. Um, we don't want to you know, scare tactic them, but that's the reality is that it's just so economically feasible for the cartels and for the drug distributors to taint things with fentanyl. Um, but we really do need to keep our eye on the ball, right? Especially, you know, when you hear things about rainbow fentanyl and all that, I think we, we run the risk of creating panic and taking our eye off the ball when we really do need to focus on, okay, what are the root causes for young people experimenting with pills in the first place? How do we address those, educate them about the risks? And if they are engaged in substance use, warning them that again, dirty marketplace, people are only looking out for themselves. So some of that key messaging there. Thank you. Awesome, it's exactly 11. Thank you everyone for joining us. I do wanna share my screen for one last slide. 
Um, this is just our information on here. Again, that's um, our email addresses. If you guys have any other questions that we could not answer today because we didn't have time or maybe it came after this webinar, please feel free to reach out and we'll definitely get them answered. Um, otherwise than that, there is an eval that will pop up after you um, exit out of this Zoom webinar. It's only five short questions and that will help us improve our future webinars. Uh, but please take that. Um, and otherwise than that, I want to thank everyone again for joining us today. We hope that we you found that this webinar was helpful. Please take care, everyone, and we hope to see you in our other uh, webinars and potentially even conference. Uh, otherwise than that, thank you, everyone.